So I can make 20 minutes last a really long time by being excruciatingly boring. Hopefully it'll go quicker. Got my timer started here. My timer stopped. Go. Okay. Um, on screen, uh, my second half of this presentation for this panel on futurescapes and healthcare information, and I'm uh, the nutrition against disease part. I draw this from the title of a, a book by University of Texas biochemist uh, uh, Roger Williams. I've been researching and writing about health and nutrition over the last uh, three years. I work with speech and debate students, and we've had past debate topics on public health, which got me into this topic uh, over the last couple uh, decades, actually. Um, the Goodman Institute uh, published my uh, paper on so critical of the federal dietary guidelines, and I've got a lot on uh, the normal nutrition uh, substack page. Uh, Dr. Williams' uh, book, oh, wait a minute, I, do I have a clicker? How do I advance things? Do I just ask? There's a clicker. Okay. So it turns out I wasn't entirely prepared. So Dr. Williams' book, uh, Biochemical Individuality, is still in print. Uh, the key to, a subtitle, key to what uh, shapes your health. And it's described a timeless classic that links the diversity of our anatomy and our body chemistry to our unique nutritional needs. We are radically biochemically individualists, and that's a good thing. I'm taking time to talk about this. We want a society of free and thriving individuals living in healthy communities. But we can't have healthy communities without healthy people. And a specter of uh, poor metabolic health is haunting Europe, the United States, and the world. The good news, I think, is that libertarians, uh, for libertarians, is we can blame, blame government for this. Um, this public health disaster and the path for recovery is escaping government nutritional advice. Um, so there's a lot to do, a lot we can uh, learn. Uh, first off, though, let's uh, spend a few minutes talking about how weird we are. We all look different, and we're incredibly different, more different inside. Uh, Roger Williams explains this, biochemical and anatomical individuality, a number of different ways. Uh, you know, we think of the chart we saw in, in biology class where the human body looks you know, inside, but we don't look like that. That's an average. It's normal, for example, for some people to have stomachs six times the size of others. Um, could be eight inches higher or lower uh, to our, uh, compared to our breastbone. Normal livers can vary threefold in size. The small intestine can be said to be 22 feet, but even in a small group, it ranges from 10 feet to 25 feet, which is why we digest food at different, uh, different ways, different lengths. Our musculature varies widely between people. Our circulatory system and nervous systems vary. The pumping capacity of the human heart is three times greater in some than another normal uh, young, young man. Our sense of smell, taste, and sight vary dramatically from person to person. That's why we like different foods. And as much as our anatomy varies, um, so does our uh, brain chemistry. Um, now, can that be turned so the top of the slide is visible, so it's the full screen? Okay, yeah, it's a PDF, not perfect. Okay, um, our anatomy varies, our brain varies, we learn differently. Dr. Williams' book, Free and Unequal, was uh, reprinted by the Liberty Fund, although it's now uh, out of print. Um, the Apple ad to think different, yeah, we do think different, we have to, our brains are different. Uh, that's why we learn differently. We are individuals in body, brain, and mind, and only with freedom and free societies, I would argue, can we flourish. Uh, so Williams' book, The Biochemical Basis of Indiv Individuality, also Nutrition in a Nutshell, and You Are Extraordinary, a popular writer writing on these themes. And the book that I draw from, Nutrition Against Disease, um, uh, can it be set to full screen on this instead of scrolling up and down? I'm not sure that it can. In any case, um, I have some of the chapters here, if we can see it. Uh, but in the first chapter, and again, what's interesting about this, this book was published 
In uh, 1972, paperback editions came out from 73 to 81, 10 printings. It was widely, widely read throughout the country. The first chapter, The Flaw in Our Medical Education, they don't teach nutrition. Hugely important for our health is what we eat, our nutrition, and yet that's not taught in medical school, or very, very briefly. And instead, doctors are taught about pills, which treat symptoms rather than nutrition, which resolves uh, uh, chronic conditions. Um, so, uh, what happened to all this, all this understanding that Dr. Williams had? Uh, he has chapters on the fight against obesity, chapters on mental illness and alcoholism, a whole range of things, and for this group, a chapter on how we can de delay old age. Again, this was in the 1980s. But all this disappeared. All this disappeared. And we'll move forward here. And instead, uh, it was swamped by uh, a mysterious epidemic that struck Americans of heart disease and heart attacks through the 1950s and 60s. So all of a sudden, President Eisenhower had a heart attack and was out of, out of the Oval Office uh, for a few weeks recovering. It was deemed a national emergency. And as you know, emergencies are always bad news for expanding government. Uh, what happened is Ansel Keys entered the stage, managed to get himself on the cover of Time magazine. And he was promoting the theory that saturated fat caused heart disease and heart attacks, that somehow saturated fat was clogging our arteries. He was able to push the McGovern Commission to pass the low-fat federal dietary guidelines. They had testimony from leading researchers, many of whom were very skeptical of Ansel Keys' claim, and argued that we don't have enough data to, to, to pass this low-fat uh, federal dietary thing uh, without more research. Uh, McGovern uh, responded, we don't have time for more data. People are dying. And so we got the food pyramid. People like John Yudkin opposed this. He was the author of Pure, White, and Deadly. Uh, and he argued that sugar was killing us. And of course, more to this, uh, Eisenhower, uh, used to smoke four packs of camel cigarettes a day. Maybe that had something to do with his heart problems. Uh, but in any case, the focus was on saturated fat, and we started uh, a decades-long campaign, uh, fat phobia, lipid lunacy, uh, focus on uh, cholesterol and all sorts of fear of fats. We got the food pyramid and a whole range of federal and industry efforts to push low-fat foods. And unfortunately, low-fat foods don't taste as good. Um, you know, we were in that, we were, you know, my family eating uh, margarine and 2% and, and milk and skim milk, couldn't have cream, couldn't have butter, couldn't have eggs because they were full of saturated fats, weren't good for us. People switched in our household from uh, bacon and eggs for breakfast to uh, cereal. So, how did the government get to this position of telling us what to eat and telling us the wrong things to eat, say critics? Well, it started uh, really with the Progressive Era. The Progressive Era had all sorts of plans to change the world. Uh, you know, government, we had the Federal Reserve, we had the income tax, we have the eugenics movement to try and reshape uh, uh, who gets to have kids, and also, there was a movement to reshape ourselves, to use science, or what they thought, and pseudoscience, to reshape people, to change our diet. They made alcohol illegal because, of course, that was a public health issue. And uh, um, that didn't work out well. The progressive elites, especially women, were captivated by the cult or the fad of calorie counting. In the 1920s, this is uh, disciplining the stomach of the progressive uh, body image effort, and, and it was nationwide and huge. Uh, women uh, wanted to be slender to differentiate themselves from working women. They dined on more expensive and hard to preserve salads and vegetables. But the US food pyramid of the 1980s, now the food plate, had its origin with these progressive era nutritional views and with religion, especially the Seventh-day Adventists with their Garden of Eden diet. And this was the Kellogg uh, brothers in Battle Creek, Michigan. People came from around the world to get eat to be healthy, eating uh, breakfast cereal instead of meat. The Seventh-day Adventists were eager to, po to popularize these low-fat diets, cereal for breakfast instead of meat and eggs. And the Adventist founders believed that meat 
caused lust in men. So a top priority to reduce lust in men for any uh, uh, a household as well as stop uh, men from drinking, uh, we're all set, uh, they thought. But to promote this dietary faith, whoops, too, too fast, um, they had the, uh, they founded the um, American Dietitians Association in 1917. And this was a, a protege of John uh, Harvey Kellogg that founded this. This becomes the Dietetics Asso Association in America. And you can watch Belinda Fetke tell the origins of this, the role of the Seventh-day Adventists in uh, trying to push uh, low-fat diets and get meat out of our diets. It's a, it's a strange and uh, unfortunate history, but we're still part of that. The Adventists and uh, ethical uh, vegetarians and, and, and vegans are still a major part of the federal dietary guidelines as long as, as, as well as people with ties to the food industry and pharmaceutical industry. Okay. So my clock says it's only five minutes. Is that even possible? Oh my gosh. So I'll, I'll slow down and then I'll panic. So the next part of our story, I think, is a, is a fascinating uh, advance and uh, 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 set of mistakes. The advance is the microbe hunters. I remember reading this book uh, when I was uh, in my teens or 20s. It's a classic book on the major discoveries of the microscopic world, sort of detective stories of identifying the invisible killers of people, about these amazing uh, 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 scientists who track down the causes of infectious diseases diseases that shaped and sometimes destroyed whole societies through plagues. Um, one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, bringing death and suffering to millions through recorded history. The microbe hunters were amazing in, in reducing and eradicating from most of the world these infectious diseases that had been a disaster through human history. Um, you know, they found what caused malaria, yellow fever, typhoid fever, cholera, later tuberculosis and, and polio. Public health authorities and the regenerators work to clean up water supplies, construct, construct uh, sewage systems, vaccinate for smallpox. Uh, they arrested typhoid Mary. Uh, uh, also got us involved in foreign policy in Latin America as they tried to clean things up down there. But that's another uh, story. Um, but we grew up really fearing microorganisms, uh, believing that bacteria, virus, fungi, protozoa, worms were dangerous and unhealthy to be wiped from our homes and our hands and our bodies. But we've learned in recent decades that uh, most microbes are partners with us. They're not all to be feared. They're important. Uh, Ed Young's I Contain uh, Multitudes is fa fascinating in going through the story of the discoveries of the microbiome, the five trillion or so microbes that uh, live inside of us. Um, we do business with them, exchanging nutrients and receiving services, much as plants feed the microbes in the soil to get nutrients. Our immune systems are now described as mostly for interacting with our microbiome, and consuming healthy foods supports healthy guts and minds, in part by uh, feeding the microbiome. The Sonnenbergs at Stanford have a book on the good gut, on how a healthy microbiome uh, improves our weight, our mood, and uh, long-term health. More books as well. There's so many books on health and nutrition, it's amazing. But having a healthy gut gives us a healthy uh, Actually, there's more to this. The, the healthy guts and minds are part of, part of the process of feeding these trillions of microbes in our gut. Um, they're populated. It's a diverse, uh, self-ordering gut microbiome. And this, the story goes, if we don't feed the microbes what they want, uh, they start eating us, our, our gut uh, lining. So it's, it's, we've got to be careful with that. Our minds, our brains are deeply connected with these microbes. We've got 10 million nerve cells through two thin layers uh, in our gut that communicate directly and instantly with our brains. So if you have a gut feeling I'm right about this, it's the microbes telling you I'm right, or maybe they're deceiving you by telling you I'm wrong, who knows. But uh, healthy diets are key, and when we don't eat for extended periods, when we fast, it's our body that's feeding the microbes, and it only feeds the healthy microbes. We control, to some extent, our gut microbiome 
by intermittent fasting, uh, not eating all the time. Uh, our grandparents ate traditional foods, preserved with fermentation and pickling and cooked with healthy fats and recipes handed down over generations. And often our ancestors fasted by choice or necessity when food was scarce or they starved when struggling through the destruction of wars. Oops. Um, okay, so now my timer has stopped. I have no idea where I am. Um, but I'll be told, I'll get a sign when time comes. So we, we are um, designed to fast as well as feast. We feasted on feast days. Our bodies are designed or adapted for fasting, even starving, and adapted to for feasting. Our metabolic systems are adopted, adapted to gain weight rapidly when food is available, storing uh, food through the winter for lean times ahead. Our ancestors had to have, and we ha still have, these what I call metabolic gifts, um, designed for feasting to gain weight and fasting when we need to. Before the Industrial Revolution, these adaptions helped us gain weight in the fall when the fruit was ripe and the grain was available, and uh, to use that, to burn that through the winter, and to have extra fat to survive spring if the crops or the fisheries failed. But these distant gifts, metabolic gifts, are now considered really sort of a, a curse for a lot of people because they gain weight too fast. Um, certain nutrient combinations, carbs and fats and pizza and french fries, for example, are hard or nearly impossible to resist. So October for our ancestors came once a year and they gained weight, but now it's always October in the grocery store and fasting has fallen out of favor. Um, medical and nutritional public health authorities actually tell us not to fast. They warn us about fasting. They say we should be eating through the day with, with three meals and lots of snacks in between, with whole grain foods, veggies, fruit, pea protein, legumes, lean meat if necessary. And we're advised to cook with healthy, you know, quote unquote, uh, fats, which are polyunsaturated vegetable oils, which are actually seed oils, highly processed, quickly oxidized, cause inflammation. So over 50 years, government and public health authorities have been pushing and funding low-fat foods, and Americans and Europeans are now uh, more unhealthy than ever. We live long, longer, or at least we did until recently, but with vastly more chronic conditions from cardiovascular disease, obesity, diabetes, cancer, autoimmune diseases, and mental health disorders. We're overdiagnosed with advanced medical screening technologies and prescribed pills that claim to uh, reduce symptoms or we get invasive surgeries. It's a sick care disaster that's overwhelming US and European medical systems. The core of my presentation though is to celebrate the good news, which is millions are now escaping this dystopian socialist, crony capitalism, sick care nightmare. They're escaping the government medical system, going into direct care. Uh, you'll hear more about advances, I'm sure, in the next uh, part of this presentation. And obesity researchers and doctors have rediscovered what was well known just 50 years ago. And this is told in uh, a number of books, uh, Good Calories, Bad Calories by Gary Taubes, a science journalist, writes on this, sort of rediscovers this. Nina Teicholz, The Big Fat Surprise, this is how I got uh, knowledgeable on this, watching her talk to the Cato Institute a few years ago. Uh, Taub's recent book, The Kate Case for Keto, has a little more of this history, which I'm going to go through. Uh, Nina Teicholz uh, runs the Nutrition Coalition, which is trying to change the federal dietary guidelines and get them to reflect the actual peer-reviewed research that has been mounting over the last five to ten years. So what happened is we had, um, we used to know, in the 1860s, the Banting Diet was popular in England. It was an essay on uh, uh, corpulence, where he basically learned from his doctor to stop eating starches, stop eating potatoes. He lost a lot of weight. He told others how to do it as well. Um, the Atkins diet, which is the, the eruption of this in the 90s and 2000s, um, it wasn't really unusual. In 1961, 
Uh, Herman Taller, uh, his 61 book, Calories Don't Count, sold 2 million copies. Um, and Taller learned this from others who were practicing this to slim down executives at DuPont. It was widely known um, that low carbs were the way to do this. It was standard recommendation. And so, and, and again, the, the importance of this is, you know, if, I, if you look at high school annuals from the 70s and 80s, most high school students are slender. They're skinny because they're teenagers. That's not the way it is today. We've had a dramatic change in the weight of everyday people, of adults and children in America, in England, through much of the world. Obesity is an epidemic. And it has to do with the misunderstanding of the theory Basically, the researchers, the government believed it's an energy balance theory, that if you want to lose weight, you just need to consume less calories than you expend. So it's a question of eating a little less and exercising a little more. And that's what doctors used to advise and still do advise. That advice doesn't work for most people. It, uh, it sets off, uh, 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 it signals to your body that you're starving, and all sorts of things happen, your metabolic system down, down steps, you feel miserable, you get cold, you lose a little weight, then you gain it back, you're miserable. Um, instead, and, and again, it's, it, it's, uh, it's blaming the victim, blaming overweight people because they, you know, are, it's sloth and gluttony, it's their own fault. These guys say, no, this is recent research uh, that it's more a hormone problem. It, uh, uh, they say it's as, uh, reasonable to call to blame obesity on overeating as it is alcoholism on overdrinking. It's true in one sense, but it's not really uh, meaningful. Instead of the energy, energy balance theory, the calories in, calorie out, the better theory is um, a hormone problem, an insulin problem. So that is more popular. You can read research. David Ludwig at Harvard, Harvard Eric Westman at Duke. Um, Mark Hyman at Cleveland Clinic, Stephen Finney at Verda Health. There's a lot of people uh, seeing these, uh, the new reality here. So we have good news. These two metabolic gifts um, are a problem for today. I write about this. And another last step I'll, I'll leave you with is uh, we had earlier presentation discussion of the epidemic of uh, mental illness anxiety, depression in uh, England. It's also in the U.S. and the universities. The anxiety of the snowflakes people complain about, maybe that's because they don't have enough energy in their brain. And that's what uh, Chris Palmer argues in his new book, Brain Energy. Metabolic Mind is doing uh, rand funding randomized control trials on this. And Georgia Ede is a leader on saying that, look, the, the reason why people are upset is they don't have enough energy for our brain. Our brain is 2% of our weight, but consumes 20% of our energy, and even more when we're uh, thinking. So, good news. You can read more about this uh, online. Uh, Terrence Keeley uh, writes about these problems. Nina Teicholz, her presentation at Cato, to me is amazing. And I've been posting on this, and I'm almost out of time. In fact, probably I am out of time. Thank you very much.